I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's international programs, the University of Iowa's honors program, the University of Iowa Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley UI Foundation support organization. And I thank today's special sponsors, John Menninger, Mace and Kay Braverman, and Dave, Denise, and Mike Tiffany. We also thank City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4, or 118-2, in the UI Library's digital archives. Over 200 ICFRC podcasts can now be found on iTunes. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robin Lovin. He is a visiting scholar in theology at Loyola University Chicago and University Professor of Ethics Emeritus at Southern Methodist University. He's the author of several books on religion and society, including Christian Faith and Public Choices, The Social Ethics of Barth, Brunner, and Bonhoeffer, translated into Chinese. And another book is Reinhold Niebuhr and Christian Realism, and several other books. Dr. Lovin is a Cary McGuire University Professor of Ethics. In his academic and theological history, Dr. Lovin has served as Dean of the Perkins School of Theology from 1994 until 2002, and previously held teaching positions at Emory University and the University of Chicago. He was also Dean of the Theological School at Drew University. He is an ordained minister of the United Methodist Church, and his research interests include social ethics, religion and law, and comparative religious ethics. He has served on the editorial boards of numerous scholarly journals, including the Journal of the American Academy of Religion, Studies in Christian Ethics, and the Journal of Law and Religion. And he is an editor at large for the Christian Century. He will speak to us today on what his visits to Moscow, Kiev, and Shanghai, and what is happening there that may be relevant to our own social and religious future. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robin Lovin. Thank you. Thanks for the, the introduction, for the conversations I was able to have with some of you before we began this afternoon. Uh, and uh, for this invitation to be in Iowa City, uh, I've been on a lot of campuses, as you uh, heard from the introduction, but really the first one that I spent any significant amount of time on was right here in Iowa City when I was a junior in high school and attended a summer debate workshop uh, that, uh, that, that met right across the street. So I'm always delighted to be back uh, in Iowa City. Had an opportunity uh, here at the church last night to uh, host a showing of a film about the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr which will be shown at uh, 3 o'clock again this afternoon if any of you uh, have not had enough intellectual stimulation by, by then. Um, but uh, those figures uh, of the mid-20th century who kind of shaped our understanding of the world might be as puzzled as I have been and as we all have been by some of the changes in the world that we've experienced over the last couple of decades, uh, especially in the way that religion fits into the social and cultural life of uh, many different parts of the world because of the way that secular ideologies have collapsed People now are looking for sources of meaning in places that they haven't sought it before and haven't had opportunities to find it in, in the past. And I've been privileged to be an observer of that in some very different settings. I'm not an expert on any of these places I'm going to talk about this afternoon. I, I'm brought in because I know those German theologians from the uh, mid-20th century. Uh, and uh, people are, are kind enough to listen to me talk about them. And I, in turn, learn some very interesting things about the, the life of those communities uh, that I visit. If you had told me back in 1984, we, you mentioned the, the, this group starting in 83, along with Chicken McNuggets, uh, 
Uh, if you had told me back in 1984 when I published a book called Christian Faith and Public Choices that it would eventually be translated into Chinese and Ukrainian, I'm not sure how I would have processed that information at the time. And if, if you had told me when I started teaching at the University of Chicago in 1979 that before I retired, I would have taught a course on political theology at the State Pedagogical University in Kiev, I would have assumed that you'd been enjoying one or more of the recreational hallucinogens that were <laughs> popular in those days. So I have found myself unexpectedly retracing some of the steps of those who carried Christianity into other parts of the world in the 19th century, but doing it in very different ways and for very different purposes. I was the dean for a while at Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, a center of uh, Methodist missions to Korea at the beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th century. When Methodist ministry, uh, missionaries set out from Drew at the end of the 19th century, they built a church in Seoul that was indistinguishable from the Methodist churches that they had left behind in New Jersey. It's, it's still there today. And they assumed, those 19th century missionaries, that the new Christian movements in Asia and Eurasia were going to be as easily recognizable to American Christians as, say, McDonald's in Moscow or in Shanghai is recognizable to us as we travel today. What I found in Russia and Ukraine and Shanghai were people who were very interested in what I had to say, but who were also very clear that they were going to take it on their own terms and use it in their own context. And so in that exchange, I've learned some very interesting things about the possibilities for religious life in other parts of the world. And I think it also says something about the possibilities for religious life here in the US. So what I have to offer are just some field notes on uh, watching the changes that have taken place over the last 25 years. As I say, I'm not an expert on any of these places, but I have had an opportunity to, to meet people and think with them about some very interesting changes that are happening in their world and in ours. At the start, I went to Russia with one of several groups from American Methodist churches who just went in the summer of 1992 to live for a few weeks in Russian cities in the, what was becoming then the former Soviet Union and learn what life was like and see if there might be some interest in building a small worshiping community of Methodists in those places. The result eventually was this building in central Moscow near the Spartivnaya uh, metro station which houses today a local congregation, a small seminary, and the central office for about 100 Methodist churches that are scattered across the lands of the former Soviet Union. That was an interesting ex uh, first exposure to the life uh, uh, of uh, the Russian people, the changes that were going on in Russian society, and the task of building a new institution in that uh, social context. But what we learned pretty quickly is, I guess what everyone learns as they travel uh, in the world in different cultures, and that is that there's a difference between having Methodists in Russia and having Russian Methodists. 
these are Methodists in Russia. <laughs> That's me on the right. And uh, uh, if, if, if you could see it more closely, I could challenge you to pick out the two Americans and the two Russians in the group. But we are, in any case, obviously Methodists in Russia at, uh, in that picture. These are Russian Methodists. <laughs> they are the students in the class at the Moscow Seminary that I taught last March. I've been able to do that every other year or so now for the last uh, 20 years and begin to uh, see even what a second generation of Russian Protestant uh, theological students are like. And how they are building a Methodist movement in Russia that is very much a product of their own experience as well as the, the history of the Methodist church. We've been fortunate uh, in that Russian experience to have talented Russian leadership that developed very quickly. Uh, on the left here, you see Sergei Nikolaev, who's the president of the seminary. Uh, has a PhD from SMU, but the most important thing about Sergei is he is a uh, native of Russia and, uh, and he's really taken the lead in uh, making sure that uh, our church fits into the cultural and institutional context of, of the Russian uh, people. Uh, <clears throat> you, you know, I assume that there's increasing difficulty for foreign religious groups in Russia today. The Jehovah's Witnesses, who were very active shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union, are now illegal in Russia. Uh, the Russian government recognizes Orthodox, Jewish, and Christian, uh, ortho, uh, yes, Orthodox Christians, Jewish, and Muslim groups as officially recognized religions. And it's then possible, if you can demonstrate that you were in Russia before the collapse of the Soviet Union, to get uh, a, official status and recognition that protects you from some of the difficulties that foreign religious groups now have. We happily were able to find in the KGB records, rec uh, records of Methodists being persecuted in Russia uh, during the 1920s, and on the strength of that uh, have uh, uh, produced, uh, have been able to register the United Methodist Church as a, a legal and recognized religious body. But it's one thing to meet those legal requirements and quite another thing to locate yourself in the culture of uh, the Russian people and the way that religion fits into that culture. In some respects, Russian culture is very familiar to us. This is a uh, billboard in Moscow advertising the World Cup, which was very much a part of uh, expectations when I was there last spring. Uh, so uh, easy to feel yourself now uh, as, a, as a part of a global uh, culture in a European capital when you're in Moscow. Uh, but the new reality of global society is struggling still to find its place in a much older Russia, which is built on a connection between religion and nationalism that is deep and enduring and was really barely touched by the 70 years of official atheism that the Soviet Union represented. There was a period of real persecution early in the Soviet era, but Stalin revived the Russian Orthodox Church for patriotic purposes during the Second World War, what's still called the Great Patriotic War in uh, Russia. And today, the Russian Orthodox Church under the Moscow Patriarchate claims the central role in religious life in Russia and an authoritative role in Russian religion. Anybody else 
is going to exist on the margins of religious life in Russia. Fortunately, Methodists have been pretty good historically at existing on the margins, and they have adapted those students that you, you saw and the churches that they're part of to that role, to playing a role of bringing a, a social ministry and counseling and uh, uh, community development uh, ministries to the local places where they are. The prominent role of orthodoxy in uh, Russian life and history dates back to uh, the very early story of Russian origins. Uh, uh, Christian missionaries had passed through Russia very early, even some reports probably apocryphal of the Apostle Thomas making his way around uh, uh, the Crimean Peninsula on his way to India, by the way. Uh, but it is clear that the conversion of Russia can be dated from Prince Vladimir of Kiev, who decided about 980 AD that the Russians, the Rus people, needed a better religion than the uh, 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 polytheism that they'd brought down from Scandinavia with them, and sent out emissaries to various parts of the world, so the story goes, to see what kinds of religions were available. And when the scouts brought back the reports, uh, the European Catholics didn't do all that well. The uh, Jewish religion was a, a clearly a minority group, but uh, the people who had been to Constantinople and had seen Orthodox worship in the great uh, cathedral of Hagia Sophia came back and said, we didn't know whether we were on earth or in heaven. So beautiful and, and uh, impressive was this, this worship. So orthodoxy it was. Uh, and uh, Vladimir, the prince, uh, became Saint Vladimir uh, uh, as a result of that uh, con conversion. If, if you want a warrior saint, Vladimir is your man. Uh, he, he was very good at, uh, at welding the, the Russian people together around uh, the, the uh, settlements and centers in, in Kiev. And even in the Soviet era, there was uh, a great celebration in 1987 to mark the thousandth anniversary of his uh, conversion. And even in Soviet times, this statue of Vladimir stood overlooking the Dnieper River in Kiev not far from the great Russian victory monument uh, celebrating the, the triumph of the Soviet Union in the Great Patriotic War. So that connection between religion and nationalism that goes all the way back through Russian history is kind of symbolized in those, those monuments on the hills overlooking uh, the Dnieper River in Kiev. There's just one little problem with that. Kiev isn't in Russia anymore. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, it, it's now, of course, the capital of Ukraine. And uh, 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 so uh, the Russians uh, centered in Moscow have had to make uh, some adjustments to uh, uh, the situation. So there's a new statue, a new reality, another Vladimir monument. Notice it looks very much like the one that stands in Kiev. But if you look at the background, it's right next to the Kremlin in Moscow. Uh, 
I mentioned a little while ago things that I never thought I would see. Well, one of them, of course, would be a statue of St. Vladimir, newly erected outside the Kremlin uh, with the support of the Russian government. The other is the sign in the Alexander Gardens, which run along the outside of the Kremlin near this, that says, please don't fly your drones here. <laughs> Uh, clearly, these are new realities for those of us who grew up in the, uh, in the Cold War era. So that's the story of the connection between nationalism and religion in Russia and the way that the Orthodox Church uh, has claimed a central place in the shaping of the Russian tradition and continues to claim that place today uh, with this monument uh, outside the Kremlin. Interestingly enough, the story in Ukraine is developing in a very different way. This is the Maidan Square in Kiev, which was the center of the popular uprising a few years back that resulted in the overthrow of the pro-Russian government in Ukraine and the, the installation of a, a, a new government, probably more democratic in its interest and orientation and certainly more Ukrainian nationalist in its uh, orientation. Uh, the, the national identity in Ukraine now is largely built around this dignity revolution, and as, as they call it, and the, the people who, whose lives were lost in that uh, uprising in the Maidan Square. The, right, the Ukrainian religious environment is more open, partly because all religious groups participated in the Dignity Revolution, but also because of uh, the different history of orthodoxy and church life in the Ukraine. Ukraine is largely orthodox, just as Russia is, but there are two Orthodox churches in Ukraine, one organized around the Kiev Patriarchate and the other uh, organized around the Moscow Patriarchate. So you've got two different Orthodox churches. You have a large body of people who are loyal to the Roman Catholic Church, although they worship in uh, an Eastern Rite, uh, and, and Ukrainian language uh, uh, liturgy, and uh, also now uh, more and more people who are simply Roman Catholics uh, of uh, the, the ordinary Western rite. So it's a very pluralistic religious environment in Ukraine, and the, the Protestants kind of sneak in uh, between these different Orthodox groups. In, in, in Russia, you have the one single dominant Orthodox community organized around the Moscow Patriarchate. You have several different Orthodox and Catholic communities in Ukraine. And one result of that, then, is a more fluid kind of religious life. There's still an important connection between religion and the nation, but no one group has a monopoly on that religious identity. So the Protestants claim their own uh, place in the uh, center along with these other groups. Here we have a typically Ukrainian church with its onion domes and its uh, uh, classically Ukrainian architecture, but that is a Baptist church. It's located in the hills above Kiev along with all the uh, historical uh, monasteries, but obviously it represents a different kind of uh, religious life that's, that's taking root in that part of the world. Likewise, when I taught in uh, Kiev, the program uh, that I was part of was 
funded by a Protestant foundation and taught in a state university. And my students in the class included both Orthodox and Catholic clergy. This would never happen in Russia. I, I do speak with and attend uh, conf Orthodox conferences in, in Russia. But the idea that I would be invited to teach their theological students uh, is, is, is probably not uh, going to happen in the, in the near future. So that's some of what is changing in that part of the world. Still a basic connection between religious life and national identity, but it's taking new forms as a result of the global changes around us. And uh, it's creating openings for new kinds of religious life that my Russian students at the Moscow Seminary also represent. So those are the realities in these two countries that are on the edge of uh, Eastern Europe. And I had about 20 years of experience there when I first went to China in 2015. But nothing I knew about Marxist lands in Eastern Europe prepared me for the post-Marxist and post-Mao reality of life in China and the role that religion is playing in that part of the world. China, of course, has a long history of religious thought, including a long history of Christianity. The group there is clustered around a monument outside of uh, uh, Beijing that dates back to the Middle Ages, as we would call it in the West, uh, and, and appears to have Christian symbols in it. Uh, so probably brought there by Nestorian missionaries in, uh, in the Western Middle Ages. And on the right, you have a statue in Macau of the Jesuit missionary Matteo Ricci, who adopted the dress and attitude and role in society of a Confucian scholar as a way of presenting Christian ideas in the Chinese cultural context. So there's a long history of Christianity in China and the Chinese absorption and transformation of Christianity that certainly goes back then to uh, these uh, 17th century missionaries like, uh, like Ricci. Uh, we're used to thinking of missionaries as being, I suppose, a bit uh, uh, a cultural imperialist, uh, like the, the Methodist I mentioned who were building uh, New Jersey Methodist churches in Seoul uh, in, in Korea. But Ricci's story shows us that there's another side to this, especially in China. Uh, what you see here is a Lutheran church in Hong Kong that dates to the early 20th century and was deliberately built by Norwegian missionaries in the style of a uh, Chinese temple. The history of religion in China, like everything else about Chinese cultural history, of course, is shaped by uh, the uh, rise of the People's Republic of China, and especially by the great uh, proletarian cultural revolution, which saw a campaign aimed at wiping out organized religion. But since the end of that cultural revolution, and since the adoption of the uh, uh, new constitution in the People's Republic of China in 1982, the law recognizes a measure of religious freedom and indeed talks in language that would be very familiar to us about everybody having the right to religious belief and uh, the, the right to, to have religious organizations that are consistent with the broader purposes of the state. China, in fact, recognizes five official religions, Buddhism, Taoism, Catholicism, 
Protestantism, those are two different ones, and Islam. Uh, on the left there you, you see a Taoist uh, uh, shrine, uh, a Buddha figure from Hong Kong, uh, and uh, then uh, a, an interesting virgin and child uh, from Macau, obviously painted in Chinese style, and a, mon uh, a uh, Muslim mosque in, uh, in Shanghai. So those five religions uh, are officially recognized, organized, and largely controlled by the state in China. Separation of re church and state or religion and state is not a real thing in China. Separation of anything in state is not a real thing in in China. So you have these five official religious groups. Now, a couple of things are interesting about that. One of them is, notice that Confucianism is not one of the five official religions, because it's not a religion in the way that the Chinese state understands it. It forms a kind of public philosophy. The closest analogy, I think, would be what Robert Bella used to call the civil religion in American society, a kind of set of shared, loosely held beliefs that, that give people a cultural identity. Again, during the uh, Cultural Revolution, there was an effort to uh, suppress Confucianism, but it is now back as an important part of public life and, and public philosophy in China. As I say, foreign control has been rigorously excluded from these five official religions. You may have heard just in the last week that uh, the Roman Catholic Church has finally arrived at an arrangement that will allow the Pope to take a role in uh, appointing Catholic bishops in China, but uh, until then you, you had the unique situation in the world that there was a Catholic Church ostensibly part of the universal uh, Roman Catholic Church uh, it, 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 that was under the control of the state religious authorities in, in China and separated from the Vatican. The reality uh, in these official religious bodies is somewhat fluid and it varies a lot from region to region. Muslims in Western China uh, are currently being subjected to a kind of persecution that is reminiscent of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, Buddhists in Tibet have similar restrictions placed upon them. But in the other parts of China, the relationships between government officials and these five uh, official religious groups are considerably warmer. And uh, uh, the, the possibilities for their working in the uh, uh, society are, are much larger. Here we have, for example, the new chapel and one of the other buildings at Nanjing Union Theological Seminary, the main theological school for the official Protestant church. The chapel, by the way, was largely paid for by the government, not because the government likes building chapels, but because the government builds all educational facilities in China, including, of course, the theological schools of these official religions. The facilities are maybe a little spartan by American standards, but they're large and new and very functional and represent, I think, the role that these official churches are finding uh, in the uh, uh, China of today. Here we have a group of their theological students in Nanjing listening to a boring lecture about Bonhoeffer by an American theologian. <laughs> Uh, what's really interesting in contemporary China, however, is the growth of avenues for religious exploration and uh, expression that are outside those official channels. Three developments in particular I want to talk about just briefly. The growth of religious studies in Chinese universities, 
the unofficial house churches, as they're called, uh, that stand outside of those five approved religious groups, and the growth of Chinese religious thought in general. It's mostly the religious studies classes that I've been able to be part of, like, like the one pictured in the class uh, in the previous slide. This is at Nanjing University. Uh, uh, two of us Americans and a couple of our Chinese colleagues uh, who were lecturing precisely about religious life and the role of the church, not just in law, but in culture in American religious life. And a great deal of interest in that in these Chinese universities. A wide interest in world religious traditions, uh, including uh, Judaism, which is, is very small in China, but has a long history uh, and uh, the, the uh, Nanjing University actually has a Jewish studies program. So uh, a good deal of exploration of these religious traditions that's going on in uh, an academic environment. What Americans are maybe most interested in and also perhaps least understand is the phenomenon of churches that are outside of the officially recognized religious structures, what are sometimes called house churches or underground churches. It's hard to explain briefly how this works because we're used to thinking of underground churches as you know, some kind of resistance movement. But the, they are neither underground nor in houses. They uh, sometimes have large buildings, uh, sometimes with crosses on uh, the, the top. The, the going uh, wisdom among people who are involved in this is you can have about 250 people involved in a so-called house church before it attracts much attention or anybody worries very much about it. Now, a lot of Protestant churches that I know in this country would be delighted if 250 people were showing up on Sunday morning. As I say, they get buildings, they put up crosses, and you get some amusing uh, interactions with the neighbors around parking problems. Has anybody ever heard that about a church in the, in the US? Uh, although there are also occasional uh, uh, cases in, in which lawsuits are brought because the cross or the steeple is interfering with the feng shui uh, in, the, uh, in the local uh, area. So, all of these are ways in which those uh, Protestant groups usually outside of the organized religious life of the, uh, of the official churches are becoming widespread parts of religious life in China. You'll note, however, that I'm, I'm, uh, I haven't taken the slides into these connections because uh, none of those churches, I would not be doing them any favor by showing up as a foreigner uh, or doing any favor for the person who brought me into that connection. So it, it, it's, it's an interesting balancing act that these, these churches are playing. But they play a particularly important part in the life of uh, uh, the religious communities in China, including the intellectual life of the universities. Most academics that I know, if they're part of a church, are part of one of the unofficial churches. I sometimes say that the only people in the world who really believe in separation of church and state are academics in China. Uh, they, they, they are pretty clear that nothing good has happened for religious thought uh, in the interaction between the state and the official religious groups. I'm, I'm not so sure of that. I'm very impressed with the Nanjing Seminary, but, uh, but it's important to understand this, this movement to take religion outside of the officially approved channels. I guess the connection between these different places that I've looked at, Russia, Ukraine, China, for all the differences in them, 
is that they have this long history of authoritarian leadership. And there's some evidence that people are now beginning to move beyond that and look to religion for a, a place to find an alternative to that kind of authoritarianism. In the short run, there's been a return in all of these societies to a more repressive uh, government-centered uh, society, and that's a worrying thing uh, for those of us who are engaged in this work. But I think over the long run, there are reasons for optimism. It may be that over the long course of history, what we'll say is that totalitarian societies were only possible for a few years in the 20th century when the uh, technology of repression outstripped the technology of communication. And now that the technology of communication is pervasive, uh, we, we have to see the long-term trend being toward more openness. I also think in a more self-interested way that it may be that after another 200 years, what we'll say is that the significance of, the historical significance of Marxism was that it saved Protestantism. There, uh, there, uh, there's not gonna be much left of Marxist economics or of the Marxist states that were built in the 20th century, but there are gonna be a lot of Protestants in those formerly Mo uh, Marxist countries that wouldn't have been there at all uh, had it not been for Marxism and then its collapse. Uh, so uh, the question that I'm left with is what those new forms of religious life will be like and what they will mean to the people who are involved with them. The question is whether the kind of freedom that they're seeking in these new religious commitments can be combined with real moral commitments and commitments to their neighbors or whether the people who are exploring new religious possibilities will simply become religious consumers who line up in the churches and synagogues and temples in the same way that they line up at Starbucks and Walmart. But of course, that's a question we have to ask ourselves in the US as well. Uh, so I think uh, that, that we have a lot to learn from the changes that are taking place in, in this part of the world. And uh, I, I have, uh, uh, gained a great deal from my, my own experience. I hope I've been able to share just a little bit of it with you today and uh, look forward to your questions about it. Dr. Levin, this question, do the churches in China have Chinese pastors or are missionaries in charge? Do Chinese men or women come to the U.S. to be trained? The, uh, both the underground churches and uh, the official churches would almost universally have uh, native Chinese pastors. Some of them will have been trained in the West. Uh, certainly always at Southern Methodist University, we had a few Chinese students in our classes. Most of them were going back into academic positions, however, rather than into uh, to pastoral positions. The, the other exception to this is there's now a very large Korean community in China, and, uh, uh, and there are Korean pastors serving uh, congregations uh, in, in, the, uh, in Chinese cities. Okay. Atheism was a strong force for decades in Soviet governance. Is it still a force? Uh, and is it still a force in, or is it still a question in China? The Chinese government is still officially atheist uh, and reg regards, uh, you know, is, is kind of caught in a uh, bind between its uh, Marxist ideology, which says that religion is going to disappear, and its desire to use this growing religious movement for its own uh, social and, and political purposes. Uh, 
but it, uh, the Chinese government is creating then a, a, an official agency for the governance of religion that is, is certainly much more sympathetic than uh, Chinese governments would have been in the past. Uh, uh, in Russia, you don't hear much about atheism. In fact, if you kind of watch the uh, television around Christmas time, you'll see uh, uh, huge crowds in uh, Russian churches with President Putin prominently among them. Uh, and uh, uh, the, it, it, the, the connection between being Russian and being Orthodox without necessarily saying a whole lot about what that means in terms of what you believe ultimately is, is becoming a very strong uh, connection. The, and, and in that respect, it's a return to the connection between Russia and orthodoxy that existed before 1917. This question asks, why did, why did missionaries feel obligated to go into these eastern countries? And, and then what happens in China if these missionaries are part of a non-official religion? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, originally, of course, the, the great 19th century missionary movement uh, was, as missionary movements ought to be, primarily about spreading the Christian faith. Uh, it, in the 19th century, that was certainly uh, confused at best in the minds of some of the missionaries with spreading Western civilization, maybe even spreading the, the British Empire. Uh, but that was, that was the motivation for the original missionary movement. What most of our churches are doing today, and again, this would certainly be the Methodist Church in Russia, is trying to eliminate uh, a, a foreign missionary presence as quickly as possible. In the early years of that Russian mission I talked about, we did have American missionaries in Moscow, in uh, St. Petersburg, and a few other cities. As far as I know, the staffing of the United Methodist Church in, in Russia is now it, it entirely indigenously uh, Russian. And, and so our goal has been to, to uh, create a local leadership as rapidly as possible. That goes along with then the globalization of higher education so, so that uh, th there are lots of Russian and Chinese students in our American schools and increasingly American uh, uh, students in uh, Russian and, and especially Chinese universities. Uh, the, the, however, the short answer to your last question about uh, what, what would happen if an American a foreign missionary came to one of those underground churches, the answer is nothing would happen because it wouldn't happen in the first place. You'd, you'd never get a visa to, uh, to do it. This is a translation question. In translating religious sources like Bonhoeffer, how do you handle Western Christian concepts into Chinese? What indigenous religions help or hinder these translations? And uh, I guess concepts like God, belief, sin, forgiveness. All that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Happily, somebody else did the translation into Chinese on, on, on my book. The, the, uh, the conversations I've had with, with people who are doing this. Uh, I, th I think they are understandably reluctant to borrow uh, language from uh, the indigenous Chinese tradition, say, for, uh, for those translation purposes. Uh, if you're trying to do a whole book, for example, uh, if, if, you're, if you're trying to uh, uh, render the Bible into uh, Chinese, as, as happened in the early stages of, of the missionary movement, you're really trying to create the whole world of thought that is in that 
text. And that necessarily involves creating a vocabulary for it. Um, the, uh, it, it at the same time, uh, there are interesting experiments like Matteo Ricci, the Jesuit scholar that I showed you, who, uh, uh, you know, where it, it's more a matter of exchanging these symbolic systems one for another. Uh, and, and of course, that enables the Chinese who look at that Lutheran church that looks a lot like a Taoist temple to at least recognize what they're seeing. But interestingly enough, it, it also causes those of us who are coming from the West and looking at that to see church in a different way as a, as a result of the translation that's going on in the architecture. This question, I understand that China is quite tolerant of local deities. Uh, what is the attitude of Russia toward these minor religions? Uh, I mean, you're exactly right. Uh, uh, local deities, Taoism is is really about the uh, uh, the the local temples, traditions, observances, and and so forth in in China. Russia again has a, a more ambiguous history here, partly because it has a longer history of Orthodox Christianization. Uh, so in, in, in some sense, the attitude of uh, Russia toward local deities was settled by Prince Vladimir, whose statue you, you saw earlier. Uh, he decided that orthodoxy really was, was a good idea. And, uh, and uh, there, there's been uh, you know, strong resistance by the Orthodox Church to those kinds of local religious traditions since then. On the other hand, local religious traditions don't disappear easily. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the phenomena that continues in Russia and probably has pre-Christian origins is the wandering holy man who is making a reappearance <laughs> in, uh, in post-Soviet Russia, uh, people who are uh, uh, figures of religious leadership, usually at least nominally orthodox in their uh, beliefs, but uh, outside of the traditional structures of the of church and religious authority. Uh, friend of mine, John Burgess, who teaches at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, uh, has, has written uh, a book which I recommend to all of you called Holy Rus, uh, which is the history of the Orthodox Church in Soviet and post-Soviet Russia. He's, he's really mastered uh, that history and the way that the church has incorporated that history of persecution into its own uh, story. But John is spending uh, the year on a uh, Fulbright grant, I believe, in Russia this year, uh, studying these holy men and their role in contemporary Russian religious life. So I hope I can come back next year and tell you about a new book uh, that will, uh, will tell you more about that. I'll make this the last question. Uh, one secular system that appears to survive today is science. What role does science belief play in the three cities you visited? That, and it's, that's a very interesting question uh, because I, I think and this congregation has done some work on uh, uh, the relationship between religion and science. And I think that discussion is more developed in the US and Western European context than it is uh, anywhere else. I still encounter uh, 
you know, a, occasional uh, resistance, for example, to the idea of evolutionary biology. In, uh, in these uh, settings. I wouldn't say it's anything like uh, universal, but perhaps the right way to say it is the suspicion of secularism, which you would expect people who were trying to uh, revive religious life in places like Russia and Ukraine and China, the suspicion of secularism that they have extends to science. And I think we've got a, a, a better uh, ex, uh, and longer track record of experience here uh, that enables us to separate out uh, exploration and use of the scientific method from some kind of secular scientistic ideology. Thank you. Let's give a big thank you to Dr. Robert Levin for his presentation. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization. We also thank today's special sponsors, John Menninger, Mace and Kay Braverman, and Dave, Denise, and Mike Tiffany, we thank City Channel 4 for making our programs available to viewing audiences. And Dr. Levin, as a small token of our appreciation, we'd like to present you with the coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. Thank you. I'll, I'll put this on my desk next to the World Cup mug I got when I was in Moscow. We are adjourned. Thank you.